Well, welcome back to the Hotel Orloff. Today we're going to be uh, putting together a, an office. So, started working on it yesterday and we'll continue with that today. Just out enjoying a stroll on a Sunday afternoon. They've got these speakers around the town square so they can pipe in music. Yeah. Scottish telephone booth, but there's no phone in it anymore. It's, yeah. Oh well. Vandals. <laughs> no, they're just decorative. Um, place where you can picnic and sometimes bands play there. The theater uh, is playing some movie called Arthur the King. I don't think it's about King Arthur. It's probably a, it's like a, who knows what it is. It's, it can't be a good movie because it's a movie from Hollywood. Let's see what this is. Oh, it's a Mark Wahlberg movie about a dog. Oh, actually, I saw a trailer for this. This actually, that might actually be a movie uh, that I might enjoy, a dog movie, but uh, that would require money to get in. It uh, says this building was constructed in 1887 by William Temby for the W.A. Simpson department store. Now, Temby, well, Temby is the same guy that built the hotel I live in. It is believed that L.P. Todd converted the building into the Princess Theater in 1914. The silent movies were accompanied by live musicians. But you're, it's, it's good that they were alive, and the alternative... Oh, well, I'm trying to be funny, sorry. For the next 56 years, the Princess continued to operate as a motion picture theater. J.H. Eddy purchased and operated the theater from 1937 to 1977. In 1937, at a cost of over $10,000, the Eddy family completed major renovations, including a new stucco and brick front with a modern marquee. Above the entrance was the word princess in blue, red, and green neon lettering. Inside were 400 new leather upholstered opera chairs and a new cooling system. Thomas and Charlene Green owned and operated the theater from 1980 until its closing in June 1985. In 2003, Paul Ramsey, on behalf of Ramsey Farms Foundation, purchased the property and donated to the Princess Theater Troupe, a group of local volunteers for the purpose of restoration and reopening as a movie and live stage theater. Paul's son, M. Paul Ramsey, a prominent Los Angeles, California architect, designed the plans for the exterior re restoration. Many volunteer hours, a vision, Iowa grant and generous community giving matched by the Deco Foundation raised over $350,000 for the project. The restoration was begun by Larry Lamb and completed under project manager Ron Lanfair. The theater reopened as a community nonprofit organization in August 2008. The original board of directors, uh, there's a bunch of names, well, they're important names, but anyway, so this theater just runs, uh, they pick a movie and they run it. Um, it only runs a movie three times uh, a week, so so Friday at 7, they run it, Saturday at 7, and then Sunday they have a 2 o'clock matinee. Let's see what's coming. It looks like some giant chicken movie. What is this? Oh, wait, what is this? Uh, oh, it's Godzilla and King Kong. That looked like a giant chicken. I thought it was like some kind of Pixar thing. Rise together or fall alone. Only in theaters March 29th. Oh, is, is King Kong vs. Godzilla already out? I didn't even know that. Well, I guess it's coming next week. I guess I'll go see that on my birthday, maybe. That, that sounds good. 
This barber shop here, the same guy's been running it since 1962. He's in his 80s now. Real nice guy, uh, real patriot, and uh, everything in there is decorated just like it's the 50s. There's a Wild Root Cream Oil Fearless Fosdick sign. It's uh, amazing in there. It's like time, uh, time has not passed, whatever the cliche is. So, here's the local gas station. It's, uh, there's the library. But uh, you didn't uh, come here to see an historical uh, town square. Uh, you don't care about such things. You're here to see comic books because you're mentally deranged and there's something wrong with you. Look at this. Not a calm trail in the sky. Beautiful sunny day. Sweeping the clouds away. On my way to where the, where the, how does that song go? On my way to where the, the grass is green. I don't know what on my this. Can you tell me how to get how to get to the hotel or off? Listen, children. So apparently if I go five laps around this uh, town square, that equals one mile. So maybe I should come here and get more exercise because I'm astoundingly uh, overweight. And uh, there's the local bowling alley. Unfortunate thing, see it's called Lucky Lanes. The L looks a little bit too much like a C and that's caused uh, it to be listed on the internet as Cucky Lanes. That's not what it's supposed to say, but, oh well, chaos demise, they say, what a shame. But anyway, uh, the bowling alley. Anyway, shoot, Dr. Fibes um, in Michigan has a much better uh, phone booth than this, much better condition, it actually has a phone in it. But the reason a Scottish phone booth is here in the town square is that this town is named after a town in Scotland. And, uh, and that's the way it is. Sunday. What is this? October? May? That's not May. Oh, April. That's right. It's April because my birthday is next Saturday. So, uh, <laughs> one of the... Uh, Wealthy uh, viewers of the WWT. We here at the Gratu Our Life Inspirational Network, WWTD TV, we uh, have some wealthy viewers, and one of the wealthy uh, patrons has um, is going to donate money so that we can get a unlimited StreamYard uh, subscriptions, so I'll be able to broadcast 24 hours a day from here in Rural Retreat, Virginia. Yes, you didn't know there was a town in Scotland named Rural Retreat, but that's because you're, there's something wrong with your mind, ladies and gentlemen. You're not intelligent, which is why you watch this channel. WWTD TV broadcasting in color and of course as all of you know WWTD 
stands for what would Tarzan do? What would Tarzan do? How do, would Tarzan act? Not to be blasphemous, blasphemous, because I know often many people have bumper stickers that say, what would Jesus do? But So, we're just trying to be a little different. As usually, what Tarzan would do is about the same thing that Jesus would do. They're both equally honorable people, wouldn't you say? I don't think so. So, let's go on in and uh, move furniture around to pretend like I'm doing something. So that I can just, uh, I'm, I have value as a human being. Okay. Well, we're back. It's Sunday the, I don't know what day it is, uh, it's, it's April, I guess. it's the 14th I believe, and my birthday is next Saturday on the 20th, and we'll have a special live stream and all that stuff, yeah, right now I'm waiting for David Wilcock to do a live stream, and in the meantime I'm recording uh, Seaberg Department Store Christmas music from the late 50s, early 60s. Because, of course I am, right, Drew? Christmas music in April. Uh, one time I had this old friend, and I put on Facebook that I'm putting up my Christmas tree, and it was probably June. He said, putting up a Christmas tree in June? Lunacy. And I said, yeah. Yeah, this guy said, uh, you call me a lunatic and you've got the complete works of Aleister Crowley on your uh, shelf and you, <laughs> I can tell you stories about that young man who's now an old man like me. What the heck, oh, let me get the charger. Fools, idiots. Swine that dare to criticize the way that the great Gratu Orloff lives here in. I don't know. What's wrong with these people? Um. What am I doing? Okay. Let's get on it, man. We got stuff to do. As they say at the Naval Academy, time waits for no man. So, look at me. I'm do. I'm getting upstairs better. I've lost a little bit of weight. Not not enough. I'm still at about 235 pounds, which is an insane ridiculous amount of weight. I should probably be 160, 170 for someone of my height. Okay, so this is what we got. This is the mess. But it was a lot worse mess yesterday and I've got a desk here now. How about that? And I'm about to move a bookcase in here and put it there. So that's what's going to happen here in a minute. And you'll be there and see it happen. So, how about that, ladies and gentlemen? <sighs> and before this broadcast is over, you'll see a transformation of this room. But you're probably saying, but I came here to see comic books. Well, there's lots of channels you can go see comic books on. Go do, go, go. Farewell to you. Um, I don't want to look at comic books right now. Although there'll be comic book books coming into this room that I'm going to put in a bookshelf here. And in that sense, yes, I guess you will see comic books. So, I'll go.
there were um, all these doors in the house, uh, in the garage when, when we moved in. There were all these uh, doors that they had. And I thought, well, why do they have all these doors? About six, seven, eight big, heavy antique doors. And, and then I uh, finally realized these are the original doors for various parts of the house. And uh, so yesterday I brought two of the doors in and reinstalled them. And I was telling you about this on the last live stream, but I don't know how well it came across. Um, I'll show you. I was really proud of myself for that. Um, this door here, it doesn't have a doorknob anymore. But I guess I could find a vintage doorknob. There used to be a place back where I used to live in Texas called, what was it called? It was called Antique Hardware. And it was just all these doors and old clawfoot tubs and mirrors and anything that had been salvaged from old houses. Um, but anyway, so I put this door in. So it doesn't close all the way. It stops about here. Um, this is what the hinges look like. So there's something going on where I probably need to chisel the wood away or something to get it to fully close. But it, it doesn't, to answer your question, yeah, I, if it fully closes and you don't have a doorknob, could you be trapped in the room? Um, I don't think so. Anyway, the other door I put in is over here. Um, this door has a nice little crystal doorknob. It's got a little bit of problem here, but see this door, it's like very nice door that uh, for this living room area here. And so, except it doesn't work too well as far, oh, there we go. <laughs> Just needs a little tweaking, that's all. But anyway, so here, one of the original doors of the house dating back to, I guess, World War I era has been reinstalled. So that's a... Uh, something so i gotta move this bookcase in so i guess i need to clear all the books off of it so that's something i will now do so let me deposit you guys here okay it's a picture of my my wife and her mom my wife when she was a little girl so we'll put that here. Man, there were these weird Martian dolls that they were selling at Target. No little girl wanted these things. They were too weird for little girls. They, I guess they thought that the Monster High dolls were popular. Why don't we make space alien dolls with four arms? And, and I saw them, and they were trying to get rid of them. They were, like, giving them away at Target about a few years back, and I just, I said, I've got to have all of them. Because um, maybe they were trying to sell these to little girls, but they, they appealed more to me. So various places in the house I have these things. I don't remember what they're even called, but uh, oh well. This is a, an important book to read. Uh, it's the official Rubber Chicken Practical Jokes and Riddles book. And, um, this is the novel that the movie Network was based on. Um, there's none dare call it treason by this man. I think Kevin at Gotham City Comics sent this to me. He, you know, in some of the first packages I got from Gotham City Comics, he sent me an amazing amount of free stuff, and I'm pretty sure he sent this to me. Yeah, I think he did. He, he'll tell me in the 
it's it's horrible it, it seems insulting to forget you know when someone gives you something what but it's just a sign of being mentally ill uh, ancient uh, nursing home resident that's all it's not anything that's all that is let's get these books off I'll show you the books once they get uh, put back on the shelf in the other room. See, this is how you justify uh, your existence, is you move furniture from one room to another, and then you feel really good for, about yourself for a little while. Just advice to you. Uh, okay. Little things like little... This was some Ultraman chocolate candy that was in this box. You know, if you live near places where there was a Japanese population, you can go into a little Japanese supermarket. There was one like that called Kazi's in Dallas, and I was able to get little Ultraman Common Rider kind of trinkets. Whoa! Here's a little Japanese cutesy thing holding this this modern technology called a, what was this thing called an iPod it was given to me by a friend because he was getting rid of it and someday that's going to be collectible and people are going to look at it and say wow you have an iPod oh good these I believe are the fangs that go in my Barnabas Collins Dark Shadows board game um, so I'm going to throw them in the Dark Shadows box next time I get that game down Yes, indeed. This uh, bookshelf has been in the family uh, since the 50s. It predates my existence on this uh, mortal coil. It, uh, there are pictures of me as a little baby, you know, walking along, learning to walk, holding on to this thing. And there's, a, there's two of them. There's two identical ones like this. and uh, The other one's like right here, but I'll show that to you in a minute. Go okay. ahead. How about that, a turn of charge. Um, let's uh, let's get these books down, man. These are a bunch of Whitman uh, TV related kind of books. Monsters, Annette Funicello, Tarzan. Now these Tarzan books, you know, if you don't have the dust jacket. They, they still look pretty cool because they print uh, images on the actual book, or at least in th this edition. Um, um, so I think the original, the old, overly old ones look more like this. They, you know, they, they still look elegant on a bookshelf without the dust jacket. All right. We'll look at all these in a few minutes. And then I'm going to go down and watch David Wilcock. But you guys will be long gone by then because the memory on my phone is not going to last long enough. Okay. So, uh, how are you guys doing on this fine Sunday morning? We had a wonderful breakfast. Had salmon and uh, scrambled eggs. Cool thing about this, when you clear off bookshelves, is you it reminds you that you own books that you have no idea that you actually own. met a um, person yesterday it was very interesting on the live stream named mean baby from back where I used to live in Texas he uh, he's, he was real interesting and uh, 
you never know who you're going to run across on these live streams that people that just click on the link um, it's incredible all right so here's one of the bookshelves and here's the other one this one's going in the other room well six months ago just trying to stand up like that would have been it, it would have taken a, a while but so that's what makes me think I'm I'm hoping I'm getting better yes ladies and gentlemen okay and we need to dust this thing off too and also there's no music playing in here and that's not good I have to have music to work. So. All right. Now to clean it. All right, now we're ready for some books to be put on it. wrong with that critter, man. Yeah, would you please silence Drew? I'm uh, doing a very important broadcast on the WWTD uh, television live in color broadcasting system. Grouchy World of Inspirational Network. Okay. Well, here's a book. I haven't taken the shrink wrap off, which is un-American. So we're going to take the shrink wrap off. Um, uh, this was, uh, there was a friend of mine back in the old country that sold H.P. Lovecraft books. And that was what he did for a living because he, he was uh, unable to work because he was well, partly because he was crazy and partly because he was about 600 pounds. And so he, he would sell people all over the world. He would order these, get a bunch of, uh, you know, Lovecraft books and then he'd sell them, send them to people. He'd get, get a big box of books together for someone. It might take him a long time that he'd send it off to them, but. Uh, he, he sold me this book, and, and I still haven't even opened it. And he's since passed away more than a few years ago. Anyway, it's by Lord Dunsany. And uh, it's the uh, Pleasures of a future Futuroscope. So, brand new book being opened for the first time. Ladies and gentlemen, let's see what it says here. This is the first edition uh, printed in 2003. So, just took the shrink wrap off a book that is, what would that be, 21 years old? 
and uh, oh, here's the the best of Frederick Brown. Look at that. It's got a uh, cover by Richard Corbin. Uh, what is this? It's a beautiful book. Beautiful book. Tala Rook. Tala Rook. Look at that gold. Um, Tala Rook, an Oriental Romance by Thomas Moore. When was this edition printed, you ask? Let's find out. I don't have my magnifying glass. Wow. I'm pretty sure that says 1917, which is the year that this house we're sitting in was built. And uh, this is what we must know about communism by the guy that wrote The Price Guide. No, it's a different Arbor Street. Maybe it's his great-grandpappy. This is from 1958. No, it wouldn't be his great-grandpappy. Actually, Arbor Street, probably his dad. Huh? We'll use that. We don't know and we don't care. Isn't that what they chant in boot camp? I'll have to ask Meyer. Uh, we don't know and we don't care. <laughs> I don't think that's what they chant, but I'm sorry. <laughs> but if I ran the military, that's what we would chant. You know, the, I do run a wing of the military, the Gratu Army. What am I talking about? That's what we're going to start chanting when we exercise. And, and I'm going to exercise and I'm going to, I'm going to stop being this pudgy, foul example of a human being. I, I'm going to start working out. I'm going to tr try. It's like, remember at the end of Dawn of the Dead that he's, he's definitely, you know, he's going to turn into a zombie. He's like, I'm going to try. I'm going to try not to come back. I'm going to try to quit Coca-Cola. I did that today, but I drank some a glass of sweet tea. It's probably got as much sugar as the freaking Coca-Cola. But I'm going to try to not be such a fat ass and uh, it'd be great if I could just like not take blood pressure medicine anymore um, that would be fantastic ladies and gentlemen um, but we all have our hang ups says Snoopy right? this is some little book that they must have sold in a drugstore I think I don't remember buying this I think my mom probably bought this yeah in the Hallmark store you know you got some friend that's uh in the hospital, you buy him this little book, you know. <sighs> okay. Oh, some more books we got to put up here. Ooh, look at that. The bat flies low. This is going to look, books like this look elegant on a bookshelf. Morons buy those Reader's Digest, Reader's Digest condensed books and they put them on a bookshelf. They never intend to read them. They're... They just look good. Oh, look, we have books. I'm that person must be an intellectual. Um, but uh, that's This will look good on the shelf, man. To convince people that I'm not as stupid as I seem, I have, uh, look at that, the complete poems of Robert Frost. So I'll put that here, and that looks very dignified. You know what looks cool, but I probably would never do it, is when people group books by color. That looks kind of cool, but it's still kind of stupid. Um, and again, our sponsor is Liquid Death, ladies and gentlemen. Um, look at this book. This is my father's Psychology for the Armed Services. It's <laughs> boring. This is the name. It's like Wayne Boring and the Superman artist. But it's just like boring psychology for the armed services obviously from a library. What's cool is that it still has a card in here that 
What is that? What was that I just saw? There's like a card in here that my father must have put in here. Like that was an important page. Oh, there's another card. He must have been using this to write his uh, master's thesis at Baylor or something. So, you know, it might be a good read someday when... <laughs> Next time I'm laid up. And, oh, look at that. I'm going to put two green books together. It all, look, oh, you can't even see what I'm doing, can you? Look, I've got two green books together. And I'm going to put some lobby cards or some photographs here. Because it's not good to expose much wall. You want to have as many pictures as possible on the walls. You don't... Now, this room has wallpaper <laughs> everywhere, including the ceiling. So, I don't know. I'll let you make your determination as to the taste of the previous owner, but uh, <laughs> let's see what we got here. This is Girl, Soldier, and Spy. I guess I'll put that on the shelf. What? Nah, I'll put it down here. Um, here's the uh, 100 selected stories from O. Henry. Of course, O. Henry, the Texas author, that is, you know, he's famous for his O. Henry style endings. That's why they call him that, and which you know is the twist endings like Twilight Zone always had, like the EC comic stories, science fiction horror stories always had this twist. Oh, I didn't see that coming. Now that I now that I see that, I got to rethink the whole story. And O. Henry was the master of that, of course. Um. As you know, here's uh, the cinema of Stanley Kubrick. This is a library book that they had uh, they sold because who knows? No. Oh, okay. This is uh, a <laughs> volume three of the complete works of Theodore Sturgeon. Look at that. From Astounding. Remember Killdozer, if you're my age, in third, or was it, maybe it was third grade, when the TV movie Killdozer came on, that was the talk of the playground. Everyone was talking about Killdozer. And uh, it, the TV movie came from the sh short story in this pulp. And, of course, it's in this volume. And there's the, the evil bulldozer that comes to life. It was, you know, an alien entity possessed the killdozer and um <laughs> and theodore sturgeon did i think he wrote a couple of star trek scripts uh, i think he did I, I who knows i've slept since the 60s a couple times so i don't know anyway so how about that how about that killdozer and, and in fact it was so influential on my generation that there's even a band named Killdozer, you know. Well, how about that? Killdozer. Can you believe it? Here's Magic by Misdirection. It's a magic book. This was owned by an actual uh, magician. Here's a book I only would mention. Uh -oh. I'm too much. I don't want to see you. Leave the seat. But it looks good on the shelf. It looks very dignified there. I'll put it right next to the psychology book. Okay. Let's go get some more books. cool book, Step Right Up. Look at that. By Dan Mannix. A true story of carnival life in which the author learns the tricks of the trade, meets some wonderful people and some crooks, and lives an odd and interesting life. This guy here. 
Now this would make a great movie, wouldn't you think? Step right up. Some of these books, you probably get them on Amazon, right? Who knows, maybe you could. Um, oh, this changed my life. Wacky Packages, here's a whole book. <laughs> if this book had come out when I was in third grade, <laughs> it's just like a book that glorifies the wonderful Wacky Packages. I can't even convey the spiritual bliss that Wacky Packages gave me. It was a fad for my third and fourth grade, and everyone was into them pretty much, but I worshiped these. And of course, I was prepared for it. I loved Mad Magazine and Cracked, and I and I was seeing these this wonderful art. A lot of this was done by Norman Saunders, one of the, and that was my first exposure to Norman Saunders, the great pulp artist. Is, uh, <laughs> these are all the great ones. And they, they would even do, uh, they even did a parody of themselves, wormy packages. Look at that Gatorade. I have a t-shirt of that. It's in the other room. I still own the t-shirt that's like tiny for a third grader. Of course, about 10 years later, it was Garbage Pail Kids and the, you know. So Kevin at Gotham City Comics, he's a few years younger than me, at least probably 10 years younger. So he's, he got hit with the Garbage Pail Kids uh, bug, which, trust me, I would have too if I was a few years younger. But this was my, what is the cliche, my nirvana, you know. It was like... I don't want to sound blasphemous, but, you know, when I first felt the feeling of praying and asking Jesus to be my personal Savior, you know, from reading a Jack Chick tract, and I prayed, and I had this wonderful feeling, and during the summer of, you know, elementary school, it's like that feeling, that blissful feeling, the only thing I can think that matches it is when I first saw Wacky Packages, and that's <laughs> that's going to be held against me, you know, at the pearly gates. It's like, you compared being saved to seeing Wacky Packages for the first time? Uh, we've got proof you're on video doing it, St. Peter says to me, and I go, oh, shoot. I didn't think you were watching the Gratu Orloff show, uh, but... I just say that to let you know how much Wacky Packages meant to me. And if, if, if you were a kid in the 70s and Wacky Packages didn't mean that much to me because you were, then there's something wrong. You're watching the wrong channel. You just don't get, you don't get me. <laughs> oh, what is this big heavy book? Oh, boy. This is a, <laughs> you know, there was the San Francisco earthquake, which, ruptured gas lines and caused the San Francisco fire. It was just a horrific thing. This is a book that came out. You know how they rush these books out? Like right now, there's like two competing big uh, book magazine things at the, depart at the grocery store about Caitlin Clark, the basketball player. You know, she's the big hero now. They rushed that stuff out. This was rushed out after the San Francisco it says, the complete history of the San Francisco disaster and Mount Vesuvius horror, death and ruin, uh, eruption and earthquake and fire. So, yes, indeed. This uh, book is copyright 1906. And, when you, and it's got, you know, illustrations. And when you read this, man, it was like... There were guys up on top of buildings, right, that were trapped. There was no way. They were going to burn to death. So the policemen, out of mercy, were, like, like picking them off. And, it, and the crowds were watching the policemen shoot these people, these civilians, up on top of buildings just so they didn't have to suffer. That's what the... Because these people, these poor people, man, there's an earthquake, so they get out in the street and think, okay, we're safe in the street. The buildings aren't going to fall on us because we're in the street. And then the streets opened up and fire came up because it, the gas lines underneath, <laughs> it was like hell opened up. You read these, uh, these eyewitness accounts 
from the time period and it's just like oh my god what they went through so anyway this looks really <laughs> it looks good on a shelf you know it you know for for gomez and morticia adams you know it's like but that's how i live to me i've always aspired to be john Aston and uh the adams family because to me that's the perfect life and that's kind of what i do i never hardly leave the house and uh to me i have the same twisted sense of humor and i have a beautiful wife and and uh, i kind of that's to me the perfection you know i wanted to be you know i i I was exposed to the Munsters first, and I loved the Munsters. I didn't see the Adams Family till later because it was most TV stations in the seventies. They they okay, we're not going to show Munsters and the Adams Family. Let's pick one, and the Munsters is more obvious because they look more like monsters. And so I, it took me, but my older brothers who were ten years older than me that saw Adams Family when it was aired on ABC, they were telling me, "Oh, that show's great." That, the 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 this Gomez guy he, he has tr a train layout and has the trains run into each other and that I thought wow this show sounds when I finally saw it I was blown away and the question is do you want to be Herman Munster you got this whole cool house a beautiful wife or do you want to be Gomez Adams and have a beautiful wife and a cool house and and then ultimately you think well do I want to be Herman Munster or Gomez uh, Gomez Adams is cooler I mean Homez Home what? I've Gomez is Herman Munster and Gomez is love child. But Herman Munster is, is just kind of brain damaged and so you don't really want to be that. Even though you might be that, if you're watching this channel, you're probably very much like him. Let's see. Anyway, so I'm in Team Gomez. But I love the shows equally. Okay. Oh, and then we have, uh, lest we forget the complete story of the San Francisco horror and by the survivors and rescuers. Um, I found both of these at the same antique mall. Uh, <laughs> it's just, uh, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Mount Vesuvius apparently erupted at the exact same time. This is also 1906, so it covers both of the disasters. Uh, um, okay. Look at this happy guy. Doesn't he look like a happy game show host? He's, oh... It's, his name is Gabriel Vagliotti. Vagli, Vagliotti. Uh, anyway, he wrote this book, which is probably a book we don't want to talk about. About Dens of Iniquity. But, uh, is it a book that Gomez Adams might have on his shelf? Quite possibly. So. Here is a... Well, better cover that up a little bit. Book about Candy Bar, the Dallas uh, unveiler. Uh, so we'll put that next to the other bar. It's a similar kind of theme, I guess. Let's get some more books in here, ladies and gentlemen. Well, shit, mother. Okay. What is this book? Time and Motion Study. I don't know. This is a book I think came from my father. Yes, indeed. Look, 
when he was at Seton Hall University. Look at the precise way that my father wrote. Um, yeah. Okay. We'll put time and motion study right between magic by misdirection and the pleasures of a futuroscope. And um, Isaac Asimov's Book of Facts. I put that down here. Um, the Way of Democracy. This would have been a school textbook. Um, this was last issued in September of 1950. So this is uh, from published in. I think it says 1940. So it was at least used in the schools for the decade of the 1940s. Um, oh, it's the same gray book. How about that? Tales from Silverland. It's Patsy's Mexican Adventure. It's, she doesn't really look scared. She looks kind of pleased. So it may, may have not been a very scary adventure. Look, it's uh, Street Rod by the author of Hot Rod. Here's the uh, Return of Tarzan. Look at that. Look at this guy he's fighting. Looks like... I've, I've, I've met people that ran comic book stores that look like that guy. Tarzan. This is, of course, from Whitman Publishing. Uh, um, copyright... 1918, copyright renewed 1941, copyright 1967. So this was 1967 edition, so that means this was uh, concurrent with the Ron Eli uh, TV show on, was that on ABC? I don't know, don't get me lying. Uh, get it? Don't get me lying. <laughs> I'm so funny. <sighs> Don't get me, Mr. Lion. Oh, here's, oh, look. I breathed myself. That's oh, so funny, I forgot to laugh. Oh, okay. Why, it's Tarzan of the Apes. They have really good barbers there in the jungle. And, uh, how about that? With an official ape English dictionary, which is very important to have that because. <laughs> Here's uh, Annette and the Mystery of Smuggler's Cove. The Mystery of Pizzagate. Uh, Annette and Annette versus Comics Gate. Whatever. Whatever joke that will make you laugh. <laughs> so we've got the whole market on Annette Funicello books covered, man. How about Annette in Sierra Summer? Oh man, it looks like kind of looks like Ricky Nelson there. And and she meets Moses, Ricky Nelson, and uh, and she runs over a deer. I bet that deer did some damage to that car. This book is a hand me down from my older brothers, probably my brother Mike. Land of the Giants. There's, of course, I had this book long before I was able to actually see the show. I never saw the show until, man, it was probably 1977 before I saw an episode of Land of the Giants. Look at that. I put my name, I wrote my name in it when I was real little. As if anyone was going to steal it from me. I don't know. But anyway, Land of the Giants. What is this book? Oh. 
They had a Star Trek one. Mission to Horatius. This is the real Star Trek. Don't trust any Star Treks that have Whoopi Goldberg in them. Or there's only there was only one Star Trek, and it was on for three years on the NBC Network. Uh, what does it say here? Good luck, Willis. Mrs. Soto. Oh, it looks like maybe a teacher gave this to a kid when they went on to, you know, the next grade levels. Probably, you know, it's a present. And I'm not going to make a what you talking about Willis joke. But I wouldn't do that to you guys. I have more respect for you Cretans. Let me get some more books. Donald Trump's speech last night. Man, when I Donald Trump was speaking and I had to go get food and I was listening and then Paulo and Graphic Man were talking to Drew about European geopolitics and stuff. And I was doing my live stream. I missed the whole Trump rally, so I have to watch it today. And then uh, here's uh, the man from Uncle. It's the uh, affair of the gentle saboteur. I think that breaks. Uh, don't they normally? Wouldn't it normally be the gentle saboteur affair? Didn't they always have affair last in the title? This is the. the I don't think they got it right. They weren't following the formula. Okay. This Munsters book I inherited from my older brother Mike and. I had never seen the monsters, but this is my this is what I knew of the monsters, this wonderful painting. And then one morning in second grade in Hampton, Virginia, I'm watching television, and what comes on is the theme song to the monsters, the opening credits of the monsters, and it's actually been turned into a commercial. Coming soon, the monsters here on some local station. And I remember running up the stairs and waking up my brother Mike, who was still, he was in high school. He was still, uh, yeah, he was probably a junior in high school. And I said, the monsters is coming. <laughs> I don't think he probably appreciated that, but it was like, you know, you had this book. You loved it at one time <laughs> back 10, almost eight years before. Uh, well... In 1972, it went off the air in 66. And that was only, it had only been off the air of the network for six years when I finally got to see it. Um, yeah, I remember that moment, seeing the Munsters moving, hearing the Munsters theme for the first time. And then just about less than a year ago, they finally released the Jack Marshall soundtrack to the Munsters. You had to get it as a limited edition mail order CD. It's magnificent, man. You need to Google it and get it, because if you don't have that, you're you're L seven man. You're a square. You're you're a worthless specimen of humanity. Let's uh, okay, the monsters. This one I got later. I have price books. I don't know how many of these Whitman monsters books there are. There may only be two. There weren't any Adams family ones. That I know. This was another book I inherited from my older brother, Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea. I didn't see that show until the late 70s also. Because it wasn't syndicated that everywhere. Uh, this was also a hand-me-down from my older brother, Beverly Hillbillies. There's the cement pond. This is a more recent acquisition. This is an earlier one, Dragnet. Look at that. Dragnet was always one of my favorites. In every incarnation, Dragnet is a radio show, as a 50s show, and then it came back in the, you know, late 60s. Always great. 
Another hand-me-down from Elder Brothers, this edition of War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells with a magnificent painted cover. And uh, and then we have Donna Parker, Secret Agent. It looks like she, it doesn't look like she has very dangerous adventures. Oh, look at this. Doesn't have the original picture sleeve, Lone Ranger and the Mystery Ranch. I think I have some other Lone Ranger books downstairs. I need to go check because I should have all my Lone Ranger books together. Written by Fran Stryker, the guy that, um, and based on the famous Lone Ranger adventures created by uh, Trindle. Yeah, let me go see if I don't have some more Lone Ranger books though. What is this? Oh, maybe I don't. Maybe I've got them here. Here's the here's one with a, a dust jacket. Lone Ranger. Yes, indeed. The Lone Ranger rides again. And yeah, stories of World War One, the Great War. You know, they called it the Great War until World War Two. You mean they didn't call it World War One before World War Two, if you think about it. They didn't start numbering them until another one happened. It was the, the Great War. The war to end all wars. Here's uh, combat, the counterattack. <laughs> um, okay. I could probably get a whole lot of content out of just showing you books. Content, ladies and gentlemen. We don't like to use the word content here. Here's uh, The Sad Sack. Um, this is um, the original Sad Sack stuff, you know, from the military newspapers. How about that? Um... Dr. No by Ian Fleming. There's Ian Fleming. And this will be, of course, you know, just when you get excited, you see it's a book club edition. If it says book club edition, it's not as valuable. You shouldn't pay a lot of money for a book club edition because they were, it's, it's just the way it is. It's the way it is, ladies and gentlemen. Just trust me. But it's still perfectly good. Same book. You can read it. Here's Party Stunts. More fun for everyone, including more on 